you for being here. Janice is a longtime friend of uh, myself. Uh, I'm KKIM when we would need a news source out of the legislature. Janice was always there for us. And we have followed Janice from the legislature to running for governor and now running for Congress. And uh, we certainly endorse Janice for this congressional seat that is uh, coming up here for election in November. Janice, thank you for being with us. Dewey, it is so nice to be with you. And you are just a rock for our community. And I'm so grateful that you are continuing your ministry. Well, thank you. What brought you to this point to run for Congress? Well, I would say since you have been with me, you know, there, there are things that need to be done. There are things at, at its basis. You know, God gave us a form of government. It has three pieces. And we are supposed to have three strong pieces that create a certain tension, but it gives us that balance. In Congress, that balance is gone. It seems that we have forgotten what our job is. And I am watching our country crumbling. And so when Martin Heinrich stepped away, I am well prepared to represent New Mexico. I am well prepared to serve. I am well prepared to make the case for New Mexico. You know, Janice, David Standridge was on here a couple of weeks ago, and he, like you, has a grassroots campaign. Yep. And you are into those communities like mm -hmm. no one else. And I think one of the biggest charges I got out of your campaign was in the primary when people were saying, Janice isn't going to win the primary, and all of a sudden Janice just, boom, and Dan Lewis steps away, and here we are today. You've surprised people with your performance because of your supporters, because of your grassroots campaign. I, you know, I am so blessed. It is literally an army of volunteers who have been with me for 16 months. And, you know, I'd like to say that it really started with uh, our Saturday morning discussion group, but it's more than that. And they have been so diligent, faithful. I, I am amazed. And I go into communities. I just got a note from a friend up in, in, in the town of Bernalillo that there is a sea of Janice signs. And that is volunteers, mm -hmm. just volunteers. You know, Janice, one of the scriptures we use, uh, love to use on this program is in Ezekiel 13, verse 5, you have not gone up into the gaps or breaches, nor built up the wall for the house of Israel, that it might stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Israel is the apple of God's eye. I believe that the United States of America is right up there with Israel with God because God founded America. There's never been a country like this. Yes. So you have stepped into the gap uh, here in New Mexico, and now you want to take that to Washington, D.C. Absolutely. There is much to do. And, you know, and just pick an area. But let's talk about Israel. You know, I, I believe the scriptures command us first to defend Israel. But for our country, Israel has been our strongest ally, our strongest ally. And in this troubled time, for us to step away, I can't even imagine it. Mm -hmm. So make no mistake, when I'm in Congress, I will stand with Israel. Mm -hmm. Stand in the gap. Let's go back to the campaign just a bit, because I don't want to lose this thought here. You know, being as old as I am, the thought <laughs> process doesn't hang there as long. One of the things that disturbs me about the campaigning is the negative ads, all the packed money, all the money spent on political advertising. I kind of like this idea that I heard a couple years ago, let's tax all this money uh, being spent on the uh, political season. Let's tax the candidates. Janice, the Democratic Party has so much money. You know, I've had this conversation yes. with you before, and you are very kind with the Republican Party, but I am disappointed in the Republican Party, your party, that they have not supported you financially as you run for this important seat in Congress. But you're okay with that. I guess you have to be because that's the way it is. Uh, it is the way it is. I, I have no choice but to run. But I, I look at this question as well. And the truth is that the Republican Party has finite resources at a national level. There are 38 incumbents. I know they're defending them. If I was in that seat, I would make that choice. I'm in an open seat. And so that's a 50-50 draw. So where are you going to put your resources? So I, I appreciate that. But when I look at the resources for both parties, um, I think my campaign is reflective of what's, of what's happening nationally. I have about half of what my opponent will have. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to win with it. Mm -hmm. And that's because I have volunteers whose hearts and their passion is for our country. Yeah, I think, you know, the, uh, 
this program is airing two weeks after the first presidential debate. And one thing we learned in that debate was what, you know, I have thought all along. You take away the teleprompter of the president of the United States and he's lost and he can no longer make up fairy tales. And the one thing with all this political money that's put into advertising is your sound, concise message can get lost yes. in all that noise unless you have a debate. Absolutely. And, you know, 30 seconds doesn't tell you whether or not I will keep my word, which is what I think people want to know. They want to know, if, can I trust you? Oh, and what are you going to do for me? Exactly. Can you get me a job? And, and, and to be able to look you in the eye and say, here are the things that I can do, here are the things I can't do. And, and you know, people really, they, they want to know where they stand. They really do. And so my opponent, you probably have heard, um, has decided that debating isn't very important. That makes me sad. I mean, and I, I, I don't mind going into the lion's den. I've been there with her. But when it comes to the Shriners asking for a debate, to, to turn that down just really surprises me. See, for the voters, I really believe a setting like this, and we, we offer her equal time too, this is where the people at home can really get to know the heart, mind, and soul of the candidate. Without all the lies that are told through political advertising, all the nothing noise, as I've called it, right. that is the platform that needs to be seen and heard by the American voters because we have become such a 10-second, 30-second news bite society where, once again, I go back to this moment two weeks ago or so with the President of the United States the light was shining on him without his best friend next to his wife, the teleprompter. He was struck with what and who he is. And a debate with your opponent or whoever the political candidates are, we need more debates. Well, Dewey, but you bring up such a good point. And one of the things that I am seeing on the campaign trail is my colleague, my opponent, is saying the same thing and sometimes I'm listening I'm going this doesn't make any sense what, what did you say mm -hmm. and uh, and and this is repeated but there are real issues that are facing our state we have thousands of people without work in our state there are people living on their iris and 401 case and they're running out what are we going to do and there are some answers that need to be executed right now you know simply Passing a budget in Congress would dramatically affect the economy in the state of New Mexico. And the reason is, is those federal contractors aren't working. They're not, they're not taking home a paycheck. They may have a job, but no paycheck. So they're not going out to dinner. They're not going to the dry cleaner. And all of those things that make your economy work just stopped. If I was uh, had a candidate that was not appearing at debates and giving forth the details, I'd be greatly concerned about that. I'm concerned. What I'm... issues are you finding, Janice, as you go out into New Mexico, are at the top of the list? I, I, I'm sure jobs are and the economy, but what is on the heart and mind and soul of New Mexicans? I, it absolutely is. Can I pay my bills? Can Can I buy groceries? Can I put gas in the car? Uh, when I am, um, however, interviewed by other media, almost always the first question is, is, so tell us about the war on women. Let me tell you about the war on women that I hear from women is, I need a job. I need to put gas in my car. I need to feed my children. How can you change that environment? So it's very interesting. But, but clearly, um, jobs in the economy, jobs in the economy. Um, Health care comes in there, but not as much as you would think. There are seniors who are certainly very concerned, and our veterans have certainly been shortchanged. There is no doubt about it. Um, energy is probably the number three piece. Is um, As we look at all of this renewable energy portfolio, uh, the cost of energy for you is going up, whether that's heating or gas in your car. It's going up, but your income isn't going up. So can we make a difference? I think we can. So what do you tell the voters then when they put forth their concerns? What are your answers for jobs, the economy, health care, energy, veterans, and so forth? Well, Let's I, go down the list. Do we, as, as you know, I, I try to tell, tell you straight. And so when it comes to jobs and the economy today, right now, as a member of Congress, there are a number of things that I can do. 
I can make sure that a budget gets passed. And if it gets stalled in, in the Senate, I will encourage my colleagues to go stand in the aisles of the Senate until it is passed. That is what I can do, but I know that a budget is absolutely critical. There are regulatory issues that are literally choking our businesses in the state. Some of them require legislation. Much of it simply requires illumination. I can work on that immediately. Um, and I wish there was an instantaneous answer that would lift people out of these desperate straits. But I, I can't tell you a lie. That's not the case. It's, it took us a long time to get into this. It's going to take us some time to get out. But there are some short-term things we can do that will actually lift people up. Right. But that's what I appreciate about you is that there's no magic bullet out there that's going to solve this in six months. No, there isn't. There isn't. And so making sure that we are not using our resources frivolously. That's the first thing. Uh, you know, when you add administrative pieces on top of administrative pieces, and I look at the Health Care Act, the administrative burden has probably quadrupled. I, I want that money to go to health care. I don't want it to go to administrative burdens. But here's the good news. In the state of New Mexico, we have natural resources. We, and it's not just enough to have natural resources, as you know. If you want to sell something you want people to buy, there has to be a need. We have some things that our nation needs. We have not only uh, wind and sun, we have oil and gas, we have coal. We have something called rare earth minerals, which is, a re is required in almost every manufacturing supply chain. And whether you want a, a grill lighter, which is going to go up because China cut us off, or whether you want to have more solar panels to put on your house, these are essential elements that are needed. We have them. Let's develop them. We, we can do this better. We have the people, and we have people who want to work. I saw a quote from you the other day mm -hmm. in the newspaper. He's bipartisan. You used that term. Is that uh, correct? I probably did. Okay. Uh, Romney talked about that the other night in the debate, that, you know, when he was governor, he brought Republicans and Democrats together to move forward legislation. And you look at what's happened in Congress in the last too many years, where there's the people's business is simply not being done. Now, with your experience in the legislature, and you've worked with both sides of the aisle, I'm sure that you're praying that you can work in that way in Congress. Right. Because it's going to take, you got to end this gridlock, Janice. Well, and, and the gridlock, you know, so when I was in, in the New Mexico legislature, there were 25 of us and 45 of the Democrats. If I wanted to get something done, I not only had to build a relationship, they had to trust me. They had to trust that what I said was accurate. And there were times that I took bills that I could not get passed, and my colleagues, my friends on the other side of the aisle made sure that important legislation got passed. Now, in Congress, we have serious gridlock and this lack of a budget, and actually the sequestration that is facing our labs and bases is a function of the fact that our current representatives did not go and make the case for New Mexico. And when there is a lopsided representation, it's tough if you were in the minority to make sure that you can get in there and get heard. And it really doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, you have to develop those relationships. And people have to know what it is that New Mexico does for our country. Yeah, I don't think there's been enough of a debate in this country about the do-nothing Congress. It's plainly in gridlock, the people's business is not getting done. Where's Jimmy Stewart when you need him to go to Washington? Well, let me, see. So let me, let me throw one out for you. These um, political consultants, uh, they're the ones who really are directing the conversation, uh, you know, directing even the, the personal attacks. And how did, how did we get so far off track? Well, they're the ones how? that are actually writing the copy for all these political advertisements. They are. They are. And, and while I appreciate how smart they are, but as voters, is this what we want? I don't think mm. so. I don't think so. I really uh, think that this debate has an opportunity to change the course of America, the first one between Obama and Romney. And you want more debates. I do. I do. You know, I would rather the people take me because they have faith in me, not because they saw some slick ad and they it's some image, you know, because I am a real flesh and blood human being. Um, there are 
shortcomings, but there are real strengths. And one of the strengths, and you and I have talked about this a lot, I understand that when we want to solve problems, the most important thing I can do is listen. Listening is key. The people have the answers. Janice, when you look back at your career and your decision to go into Congress, what are factors that have uh, been in your life that have put you on this course? Well, you know, there were, I, this started a long time ago. When I was the vice president of ASUNM, I earned an internship in the New Mexico legislature, which clearly changed the path of my life. Uh, at that time, I helped to write the criminal sexual conduct code for the state of New Mexico. There were huge problems, and, and clearly we had a big problem with rape in our state. And it, so we fixed that. I actually kind of thought I, I married my husband, went uh, all over the world, and I thought, oh, well, I'm done. But I wasn't done. Explain okay. that why you went over the world. Your husband. <laughs> well, well, my, my husband was in the Navy. Yeah. Uh, he is a, he is from Santa Fe, but he joined the Navy. And so when we got to California or to Hawaii, people sought me out. They said, you you know how to do this. And so I helped to open a rape crisis center at Kapiolani Women's Hospital in Hawaii. We opened one in uh, Tripler Army Medical Center, the first in the country. And again, I thought I was finished. But you know what? And my opinion, God has a funny way of calling you to work. And so it really didn't matter where I lived. There was real work to be done, whether it was in education, whether it was in women's issues, whether it was serving the military community. And again, when I got home, we came back in 1994, I was quite content to be the chief coach for AYSO. But George Buffett, my predecessor, decided to retire. I clearly was prepared to go serve in the legislature. And so I went. And I, I, again, you know, this is not this is not my ambition. It's not my career, but it is my desire to serve. And then you earned the title Lady Sunshine. Yes, I did. With, with, Tell that story. With your help, I might add. Um, well, as you know, I served on the Tax and Revenue Committee, and there were things that would come through that committee at 11.30 at night, and there was nobody there, and one in particular, the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Authority. That still just bothers me because they can tax you without any right of redress. I think that's wrong. Um, but there were deals being done in the committee, and you could not see it. And the access from around the state, there just wasn't any. So uh, here it was just before Christmas. I walked into the Senate chambers, and Mark Boitano, who had gotten the money to have cameras put up, all these cameras were coming down. I was so mad. <laughs> I was just so mad. So uh, as you know, I have this Saturday morning discussion group. And I was stomping my feet. And they kind of looked at me and put their finger in my chest and said, so what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I could take a webcam. And that's what we did. And so I took a webcam to my seat within the rules of the legislature. Uh, I did not use their, their internet system whatsoever. And on that day, I started webcasting. And uh, there was a lot of ballyhoo that the, uh, the chairman of the committee asked me a lot of questions. The truth is, the chairman asked me a negative question, and it went like this. Uh, Representative Arnold Jones, I understand you intend to webcast, and I presume if I ask you to stop, you, your answer will be no. <laughs> and all I had to do was sit there and smile and shake my head. That's correct. And that's how it started. But with all, you know, I have to thank the news media. This, you could not keep this a secret. And the but, media chose not to really release it until I did it. Yeah, and, and that's where you've got guts. And, you know, as little as you are, you have <laughs> guts. You've got firepower, and that's, that is what is needed. The people need to know what the legislature, Congress, is doing or not doing about the people's business. I'll never forget that one video that showed that legislator sleeping on duty. But, you know, it, it, it's many, many small victories. And before I ever got to the webcams, I want you to know there were others who fought for this, too. Um, the pre-filing of legislation. So in the state of New Mexico, you can actually read much of the legislation before the session starts. That was a bipartisan activity that was done with, um, with Senator Peter, who is now Senator Peter Worth. And the day that this finally came up to vote, the speaker had held the clock for five days. And that was my fight. And those are, so sometimes where you put the scalpel is really important. And I am so privileged to kind of be in that position, is to see where, where I can really make a difference. So you've been in the trenches, and now you want to take that to Washington, D.C. 
Romney said in the first debate that his first day he's going to call the Democrats and Republicans together okay. and set the tone and let's work together. My prayer is that that will happen. Many presidents have said that and nothing has happened. But of course, I, you know, you, both of us will remember the days of Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill, right. and how things can happen with the Republicans and Democrats working together. What will you do when you go to Congress to help that? Well, so I have a funny story to tell you. Um, my opponent uh, actually was in a public setting and actually said she could not understand how anybody could be a Republican. I don't know how that strikes you, but for me in Congress, I don't care what your position is. We may so be so diametrically opposed. It's my obligation to respect your opinion because you represent other people. Now, I may not agree and I may not understand, but I must listen because in there I am going to find the truth and the path forward. And that's what I will do. How is you as a new member in D.C. in Congress there can make a difference. Well, so there, there's certainly a hierarchy. And to think that I will carry major legislation the first year, probably not going to happen. But I will work, and I have a plan already laid out. I, I have to work very quickly to establish those relationships. But one of the things that new members get to do is we get to go after the House rules. And, you know, because chances are you're not going to make it. But here's a House rule that I do want to change. The schedule for Congress needs to change. Currently, Congress goes to work first thing Tuesday morning so they can be out at noon on Thursday and back in their district. Now, I don't know about you, but it is really hard to create relationships and do real work in two and a half days, and then for those in the western states to come back home in two and a, less than two and a half days, uh, go out and be with your constituents without actually being in a comatose state. So here's my proposal. Congress needs to go to work three weeks at a time, Monday through Saturday. Three weeks on, two weeks off, because when I'm in the district, I want to physically be able to listen to my there constituents. Go. There you I go. It makes that. common sense. <laughs> you know, Janice, I've always said that you're one of the most intelligent state legislators that I've ever met in my 37 you? years of news. And what you just talked about, you're not going to hear from your common person running for office because they can't think that deep or are not that willing to think that deep. They're more concerned about whatever they can say in 30 seconds to get themselves elected. But the thing that I've really appreciated about you over the years I've known you, and this is part of my testimony about Janice Arnold Jones, is she's intelligent and she knows the issues deep, deep. And we've become a shallow country and we vote on emotion, and we don't get the details. We don't do our research. So hopefully today's program here has made a difference in your knowledge of Janice Arnold Jones and this race for Congress. We've got two minutes left, Janice. I'll leave that with you to leave our viewers with some final thoughts. Oh, Dewey, thank you. You know, it is such a blessing to be here, and your friendship through the years has really just been a, a real source of strength for me. I really, really appreciate that. But I want to go to Congress. I would like the privilege of representing the state of New Mexico. I am prepared. I know that we must deal with jobs. We must deal with the budget. We're going to have to deal with regulation. And we didn't even get to talk about taxation, but nobody thinks it's fair anymore. I spent eight years on the tax committee, and I assure you that we can redo our tax system so it is simple, broad, fair easy to understand, and there are real metrics to do this. We have to start choosing to stop picking winners and losers and simply treat Americans with the respect that they deserve. Those are the things that I would like to work on, and I promise you that when I am elected and your representative, I will still be in this district, and on every Saturday morning, there will still be an open town hall type meeting, and I will still bring the coffee, because I want you to be there. I want to listen to you. Um, if you would like to join us, we haven't got much time left. My campaign office is 505-797-8030. My website is Janice2012.us. And Dewey, I, this is the fight like no other fight, in my opinion, for our country. Amen to that. And we'll just leave you with this scripture again. Uh, 
Bishop Jackson said this the other day at a meeting of Catholics and Evangelicals, and this is a call to all of us in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 13, verse 5. You have not gone up into the gaps or breaches, nor built up the wall for the house of Israel, that it might stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. We need to stand in the gap for biblical principles. We need to stand in the gap for Israel. This program now is a couple weeks old since Syria attacked Turkey. All hell is breaking loose in the Mideast. Who knows what has happened in the Mideast since we taped this program. But let us pray for the Mideast. Let us pray for Israel. These are exciting times, as I say, because we are seeing biblical prophecy play out before our eyes. This election coming up in November is probably, I know in my lifetime, the most important election Ever. It could be the most important election in the history of America, at least yeah. right up there, number one, two, three, or four. I pray that you are registered to vote. I pray that you will vote, and I pray that you will vote with your biblical principles, your biblical principles. God bless you and yours, and thank you for viewing tonight here. God bless you.